Welcome to Revelation Reimagined. Great to have you back again today. Once more, we study the prophetic book of Revelation. We talk about, well, all the things that it raises or some of the things that it raises at least. There's always more than we can cover in these sessions, which is why it's so important to read this and study for ourselves. What's it all about? How does it speak to our lives? What does it say about the future? They're all things that we hope to touch on in this online discussion and exploration of the book of Revelation. With me today, once again, I have from the far end, Michael Mahadu, Peter Hughes and Roman Halupka. And my name is Darren Croft. We are four Seventh-day Adventist pastors who love to study and read and share from the book of Revelation. One of the things we've discovered in the book of Revelation is it's not just there to scare people. Um, it's actually there to reveal Jesus to us and his plans. And so last week we saw this amazing picture of a wedding supper and then the, the flip side of the wedding supper. And that was very much pictures of judgment, light and dark, um, both being on display. But it introduced cause for celebration because it connects to what happens when Christ comes at his second coming. And that's what we pick up today as we dig into Revelation chapter 20. And as we go into this chapter, what you will see is there are four, in essence, four sequential pictures or four pictures looking at this thousand year period from a different angle. And we, we sometimes call this thousand years the millennium. So let me turn to those with me here. Tell me about, before we get into the, the text itself, tell me about the thousand years. Why is there a thousand years? Why is there a judgment? Doesn't God's love just save everyone? He does, no doubts. Oh. He loves us so much that he could he could just make it in such a way. But but we are so proud that we think that judgment is only because of us. But we have to still remember that it's a much wider picture. Uh, judgment is about God. God was accused. Mm. God was uh, criticized by Satan. And there was the great fight there, uh, well, not typical fight, but controversy, we could say. And, and you know, because of that, uh, how, to, how to prove in the whole universe, all inhabitants there, the angels there, how to prove, how to show. God showed the love, sending his son, but we can be the proof, as we mentioned already, talking about judgment. Every one of us has a privilege to prove that God is right and God is righteous and God is loving because, because he, uh, we accepted him and we are saved. So that's the reason. That's, I think that's, that's the main reason of judgment. And uh, there would be simplifying very much just to save us and God like a machine for mm. saving, you know, mm. without any conditions, without anything. No, that's, you know, God is not pushing salvation on anyone. He's just mm. wanting us wisely to accept it. Mm. So choice, choice is always maintained. Choice, yeah. yeah. In the scheme of things, we usually bring them back to two fundamentals, black and white, hard and soft. Everything comes back to that sort of uh, analysis. And in what we're talking about is a love for people or a selfishness. And when when God was accused, he was accused because there was selfishness behind the person that accused him. Mm. And God said, all right, I'm going to give people free will. I want you to choose. Are you interested in a concept of love where you embrace everyone or are you interested in the concept of selfishness? And that's the challenge that we have. Do we want to choose love or do we want to choose selfishness? If we choose love, then we have a compassion and an, an, an ability to appreciate all people. Mm. And it's not just written on your document, it's written in your heart. Mm. It's part of your character. Yeah, it's a, an ongoing mm. choice we make it's every single day. ongoing choice, yeah. yes. Mm. Michael? Uh, I'm thinking when we have a natural disaster and the rescue... Um, 
agencies, they fail to come and help people, mm. then there is a, a review, what happened, what, what went wrong, uh, why the rescue authority could not come to, you know, help people. Um, and I think a judgment is something like that, where it looks back to see, is there anything else that God could have done to save these millions and millions and millions of people? That were going, that are going to be lost, and I think this is this is a very important. Is there anything that God? Uh, is there any pre, pre, uh, provision that God has not uh, made available for people to be saved? Uh, and of course, it reflects back into who God is. And uh, from the Book of Revelation, we we find actually from from the whole Bible that there is nothing else that God could have done. So the ultimate sacrifice was paid. His son was given to die for us. Above that, there is nothing else that God could have done. So uh, for me, the judgment, it shows that God is fair with every single individual in a sense that every single individual that lives on this earth has plenty of opportunity to respond to the gospel call. But they have chosen to say, no, I'm not interested, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And God is obliged to, to um, respect the free will of the individual and allow people to choose the path that they want. So that judgment exonerates God. Exonerates God. <laughs> what you're describing is the ultimate universal exercise of transparency. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, and that is so essential for everyone. It's essential for me, for, for, for us, and for every single person that is saved uh, and that is not saved, because we'll see the chapter is bringing up yeah. all those people that are not saved, so they will be understanding why and why they're there and they're not here. And I guess when, when we're looking at it in terms of God's character... What we're saying is God is not going to force anyone into his kingdom. Those that are in his kingdom are there because they want to be there. Yeah. Yes. It wasn't an accident. Yeah. It wasn't by mistake. Yeah. But mm. it was by choice. Yeah. Mm. Now, in terms of this judgment process, just um, what happens? Because sometimes we talk about it being a three-step or a three-phase process what do we understand in terms of this process of judgment before we, we'll, we'll go into the text in a moment, but how would you just give a quick overview of that? In a, in a trial, uh, evidence is presented. Yeah. They review the facts, and, and, and if they review the facts correctly, they can come to an accurate decision. Mm. And that, but, uh, and from that, from that accumulation of facts and the review of the facts, you get to a situation, is the person guilty of what he's been accused of or is he innocent? So that's step one. That's step one. Yeah. Yes. And if I may add something to this, because at the same time, as Peter, you mentioned it, I thought, well, who of us can say, well, I'm sinless, I'm absolutely perfect? <laughs> None. So... So during this process, God is looking, you know, about our, our motives, our, our desires. Mm. Uh, he's, he knows our heart. He knows our thoughts. Well, it's, sometimes it can be scary. You know, if someone hmm. knows all the thoughts that we have. Yeah. But, but, you know, God knows everything about us. So his judgment will be absolutely justice. Well, well, it draws us back to Revelation 7, doesn't it? With yeah, the, the yes. white robe of yeah. Christ. You know, yes. Peter, white, you'd be happy that we bring I'm that out. I'm happy with that, yes. Um, because it's white. But the white robe of Christ <laughs> yes. is his covering of yes. us. And as we have that robe, we are considered yeah. yes. not guilty. That's mm. right. He, he has taken away the evidence that said we were guilty. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And that, but... So what Roman was saying is that we're on trial and we will be judged. Mm. It's so we're not the people who are deciding whether we're guilty or innocent. Mm. It is being reviewed by an external judge. Yeah. 
So, so then step two in the process, if, you know, you go to court here on earth and you're found, well, if you're found not guilty, you walk out free as a bird. Mm. Um, likewise, in the biblical description of judgment, if you're not guilty, your name is written in the book of life and you've, you're done, free. finished yeah. as far as judgment goes. Um, if you're found guilty, then there's a review. You know, on, on, on an earthly court, the judge will sit down, will review your case, um, look at the severity of the, the guilt, um, look at comparative cases and come up with a judgment. That's phase two, if you like. Um, and then phase three, you're brought back into the courtroom and, well, you know, here's your, your judgment, life in prison or, you know, whatever it be. Um, that actually can't, happens in this chapter, doesn't it? All right, and that's what we're going to get to. So as we go through this chapter, look for those three phases or three steps of judgment. So let's come to the, the first picture first. So this is Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. It's not a long chapter, so we are going to take the, the time to read through these four different pictures that we're given. So Revelation chapter 20 and verses 1 to 3. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time time. So let's talk first about this abyss, this bottomless pit. What is it? What are we seeing here? Well, it does have a connection with creation. Mm -hmm. The word that is translated here as abyss was a similar word that was used in the act of creation. And it was, it was talking about the state of the earth without anything done to it. It was a desolate place without light, with turmoil, tumult and turmoil, and, and it was actually referring to the waters. So it's an uncreated world. It's an uncreated world covered with water. Yeah. And it, it applies in that application. So it is suggesting here that the world is going to be taken back to that state. Okay, interesting. Michael? So at this point in time, we, we understand that this abyss is a location somewhere, all right? We don't speculate yet, we don't know exactly where it is, but there is a location somewhere in this universe where Satan will be locked up, all right? What, what, I, found, what I find interesting is when we try to understand what is this abyss, and we are putting together all the verses in the Bible that are talking about this, this place, bottomless pit, mm. that has to be a location somewhere, uh, we, we find that there is a common do denominator, and that is, this is the place where God's presence is missing. All right? Because we know, the Bible tells us that God is present everywhere in the universe. Mm. All right, there is no uh, a place, a corner in the universe where God is not present. He is omni, omnipresent. All right, so this bottomless, bottomless place has to has to be a place where God is not present. God is withdrawing His grace, His love, His mercy, and Satan is allowed to experience what it means to be outside of God's grace. So it's just a logical extension of the process that's already been occurring as God withdraws his presence. Yes, absolutely. So we see, we see this in the book of Revelation, a gradual withdrawing of God's grace. And now we, we reach the, the climax mm. where Satan is allowed for this long period of time to be outside of God's grace. And uh, yeah. So, so it's interesting because... There are some Old Testament connections on this one as well in terms of some of the language that's used. Now, before we go to them, I, I should just clarify, we are talking here at the beginning, so going back to our last session where we had a, a second coming picture, this is now after the second coming that we're looking, isn't it? 
Yes. So this, this first picture that we're getting is, as it says there, you know, it bound him for a thousand years. So it's at the beginning of the thousand years, but after the second coming. It has to be after the second coming, because if when we read in the chapter, it talks about uh, uh, the resurrection. Yes. Right? The resurrection of the saints. So when we read what other parts of the Bible, in uh, you know, the, the resurrection takes place when Jesus comes. Apostle Paul explains that very clearly. First Thessalonians chapter, chapter 4, 16, 18, Apostle Paul says, when Christ comes on the clouds of heaven, then he will call out um, John chapter 5 and other places. So definitely it has to be after the second coming yeah. in a chronological order. I want to throw a spanner in you. <laughs> what you've been saying. It. Could it be that this place where Satan exists uh, happened earlier than the second coming? Keep going. I'm thinking of there was a war in heaven in Revelation chapter 12. Mm -hmm. Michael fought against the dragon and the dragon fought against Michael, but the dragon didn't prevail. He was cast out. Yeah. Where was he cast out to? We believe he was cast out to this earth. Yeah, that's Revelation 12. Yeah. Revelation chapter 12. Mm -hmm. So if he's cast out to this earth, then it is suggesting that this earth is now the bottomless pit. Now, it's an interesting connection you make because, you know, one of the, well, there's a few Old Testament references, but there is an Old Testament reference out of Jeremiah chapter 4 that does refer to essentially the earth being desolate, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, the earth is going to be returned to a state of utter desolation, mm. utter brokenness mm. and that. But for Satan to exist where God isn't, would be the only place in this universe would be this earth because this is where he was thrown out to. Mm. Mm -hmm. okay. Jesus is not here physically. He's here in spirit, in your heart, yeah. in our hearts. But Satan has control over many of the people on this planet. So you've got to choose, am I going to be under the leadership of this general, this warrior or am I going to be under the generalship of Christ mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who in Revelation is described as Michael. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Michael? Yeah, just going on the same line because it's, it's quite interesting. When Jesus crossed the um, uh, Lake of Galilee on the other side and he, he faced those uh, demoniacs, one or two, um, and then and then the, the reply was, don't throw us into the abyss. The request of the demons was, don't throw us into the abyss. And then mm. Jesus allowed them to go into the, the herb of, of pigs. What is that abyss that the demons were talking about? So again, it has to be connected, as Peter suggested, with this earth. Mm. So this abyss, abyss should be somewhere on this earth. Um, and, and again, we connect it to the fact that it's there where God is not present. So wherever, wherever, you know, Apostle Paul talks about the, the authority in the, um, of the air, uh, maybe you can help me a little bit more with this. Um, so, so it has to be a place where, like they, they wanted a place to go to, didn't yeah, they? Satan has Satan has his headquarters. Mm. God is not present there, and that is a terrifying place to be. And the demons did not want to leave these uh, these humans and to to be thrown out and to yeah. go back into that place that is so terrifying because God is not present. Yeah. Uh, but the Revelation twenty takes a step forward where the whole earth becomes actually uh, a place where God's presence is not, is not here. The book of Job is interesting because Job was a believer in God and mm. did everything he could to stay in connection with God, yet Satan accused, uh, or a meeting was called in heaven where where God and the sons of God were. So this is Job chapter 1 and 2. Job chapter yeah. 1 and 2. And, and Satan came 
to be part of that meeting. And God said to him, why are you here? And he said, well, how come you're here? But I didn't invite you. And he said, well, I've come representing the earth. Mm. And then Job's, and God said to Job, but what about my servant Job? Sorry, I might have said God said to Job. No, he, he said to Satan, mm. what about my servant Job? He was saying to, to Satan, where I have people who believe in me and trust in me, that... There I am. ...is where I am. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But when... So Job then went through a process where Satan challenged him. He took all his property and then he punished him. Yeah. But he didn't break him. So wherever people who have a, a, a heart and a relationship with God are, God says, Satan, you aren't in control of that. Which fits with the whole concept that Jesus talks mm. about where he, he talks about my kingdom is not of this world. You know, That's it's not right. a physical yeah. kingdom, it's a spiritual kingdom that lives yes. within. And I think it, it's interesting too. So, you know, if, as we're suggesting that the possibility that the earth is actually, you know, reverts to an uncreated state and that becomes the abyss after the second coming, um, that actually fits neatly with the, the passage we've looked at in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 that talks about when Christ comes, those that are his go up into the air to meet him in the air and go to be with him. Yes. And, and so in that sense, during the thousand years, as we'll, we'll see as we go into this further, there's something that happens on earth, but there's also a heaven where the saved are with Christ. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I just want to note, in Revelation chapter 9, it talks about the devil having the key to the bottomless pit. Mm -hmm. Everything's changed when we get to Revelation 20, because in Revelation 20, the devil is now thrown into the bottomless pit and he's locked there. Locked there. Yeah. He's got no key anymore. That's right. And I think this is part of the good news of, of Revelation. Mm -hmm. So we widen quite much, you know, the definition of bottomless pit because, you know, we usually understood by this only the state of the earth, you know, after this great coming of Jesus mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. cataclysm on this, aim, uh, on this earth and everything what's happened. But now we understand, well, there are so many people who are saying now, that we are living in a hell, they say, mm. not on this earth. So, so it's coming together to this understanding that that's as, as his kingdom here. Yeah. So we have this. Yeah. We have this. But the change, what you mentioned now, is very important. Yeah. You know, now he is locked. Yes. Yeah. All right, let's go on to the next picture that we're given. So this is Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 to 6. And you'll, you'll see the focus shifts. And so it begins with the words, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. So the scene has shifted from, you know, the abyss, the bottomless pit and Satan to now a new group of people, um, you know, those who are seated on the thrones, given authority to judge. And we'll read from there. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And then you'll see this translation has verse 5 or part of verse 5 in brackets. It says the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. All right, very different picture now, isn't it? Yeah. What are we seeing this time? Well, the scene of a judgment. But that's something very interesting, you know, because for me it's again the proof of the character of God. Mm -hmm. Well, he could say, are you happy you are in heaven? Be silent. Nothing to talk. I, I did it. I decided. It could be done so. Yeah. That's probably most of us as people we would do it. So yeah. mm -hmm. we decided and it's so. But yeah. I, I, I've saved you. Sit down, be quiet yeah. and be yeah. grateful. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, but, you know, but God says, no, no, no. I want you to understand everything. Yeah. I want to know why it's so. You even call it that it was righteous, all right? But 
look at this, look at this, how it was done. Mm. And mm -hmm. well, because I, I thought quite a long time, you know, what does it mean that we are going to judge? It's everything is done already. The people on this yeah. earth, unbelievers, died, perished. We are in heaven. Jesus took us there to the prepared place. So why to judge? Mm. Just to prove. Just to prove, just to give us opportunity to understand, maybe for the first time, completely to think in a way as God is thinking. Mm -hmm. We're the jury. We're the jury, the people that review the evidence that yeah. has been gathered mm -hmm. and that. It's, and it's back to this exercise in transparency, mm -hmm. isn't yes. it? Yes, yes. The, the, people, the people who have been taken by Christ were believers in Christ mm. And they've gone through a great ordeal. They've been persecuted, they've been abused, they've been criticised maybe. They've had to stand on principle yeah. and they needed to know that that stand that they took, that action that they did, the belief in God, has been vindicated and shown to be true mm. because they're reviewing the records of everyone who has... Who didn't make it. ...not done what they did. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Michael. I, I'm going to pick on... on um, a concept here. It says, and I saw the souls of those um, who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus. So um, we should not imagine that this is like uh, disembodied spirits. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah. it's, it's interesting. It says, I saw the souls. Who are these souls? S souls? And then it, it gives more information. Uh, it says they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Mm. So those souls are not disembodied body, uh, bodies, uh, disembodied In people. Uh, they are those people that have been resurrected. And, and again, it confirms the fact that when the Bible says a soul, we are four souls here. There is no such a concept of separation between between the body and the soul, and the soul is something spiritual that goes up or down. Or um, uh, the, the Bible is using the word soul for person. Mm. We are four persons here. We are four souls here, uh, and this is the expression that is used here. Those souls actually these are the people that have been resurrected, yeah. and they are there in person uh, at the judgment. Yeah. So, so the first picture we get in Revelation 20 is that picture of judgment from the angle of the devil. Picture number two is judgment from the angle of the saved. All right? Yeah, yes. correct. So, correct. So, and, and what it reminds us there is if you come up in the first resurrection, which happens at the second coming of Christ, it's good news. You're home and hosed, if I can put it in such terms. If I may say something, you know, uh, I think now that there is so popular among so many people, very, very sincere people, uh, that, that, you know, this millennium time, they say that there is another chance for the people living on this earth. It's called hiliasm, this, this teaching, and, you know, and it's, that's something against this chapter because it's so simply said what is happening. Mm. Resurrection, the others are perished, so there is nobody to be saved that moment. Well, there is the end. Which we'll come to. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And you're right, Roman, I, I agree, because you look at all the pictures mm. that Christ gives yeah. and you've got the sheep and the goats, the saved yeah. and the lost. It's always two groups. Yeah. And at the second coming, you're in or you're not. You've, you've decided or you haven't. The, the goats and the sheep. Yeah. There is no more any opportunity to change. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Which... Which is why this life matters, Peter. Yeah, well, it, it says in the text you, that you highlighted, Michael, the second death. Mm. So there are two deaths. Yes. Does that mean we who are part of the first resurrection are going to die and be resurrected again? Or is it talking about something else? Let's keep reading because we'll answer that as we go, won't we? All right. So let's look at this next picture, Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 to 10. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle. 
In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. So now we're looking at the end of the thousand years. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown and they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. Uh-huh. Oh, scary. That's All talking right. about hell. <laughs> sounds, sounds like hell, yes. Um, All right, so let's look at this picture. Satan is released. The nations are resurrected in order to receive final judgment. Why? Why be resurrected if they're just going to be destroyed? Well, there has to be balance in things, doesn't there? That's what we're talking about. If things are out of balance, people get a little upset. God's people devoted their lives to being appreciative of him and loving other people. These people haven't, so they've gone through the court process. They have been through the process of judgment and they've been found to be wanting, Hmm. that it wasn't in their nature, it wasn't in their heart to be kind and compassionate and love in that relationship. So now we come to the situation of the punishment being meted out. Yeah. So, so just talk to me about, you know, where, where we have this lake. Of, maybe we'll come back to the lake of burning sulphur when we've read the last mm. picture in Revelation. But just this day and night forever and ever comment, you know, that sounds to me like an eternally burning hell, which I start to have a problem with because that brings into question the, what sort of God we serve. Mm. Well, you know, that's, that's, it would be the good news, you know, because this fire is not so strong. If I'm burning and burning and burning all the time, so it means that the other way, God had to be me recreate and recreate all the time. There's nothing in the Bible about this. So, so if it is the, the end, as we mentioned, and that as it is the fire that, that is even, we say, uh, ever and ever, so it means there will be the result, the effect of this forever and ever, they will be burnt. Well, we, we all know what it means to burn something, you know, mm. on a bonfire or even on our fireplace at home. So it disappears sometimes. It seems that, oh, it will be long, that in the morning I remember I had such a fire at home, a uh, fireplace, and, and, you know, I came in the morning. That's just ashes. Yeah, ashes, yeah. nothing more, yeah. nothing more. So that's... So it, we have to think sometimes as we read such words. That, that's a typical expression for those days that, you know, forever and ever meant to the moment as it will cease to Until to it's exist. done. That's done. Yeah, Michael? Yeah, pro- just, just an example. <coughs> we need to understand the way the Bible and the Bible authors are actually using that example, mm. uh, that expression, all right? It's very important because if we apply it uh, to our culture, it's got a different meaning. So in Jude, Jude is the book, the little chapter just before yeah. the book of Revelation, chapter, um, so yeah, just one chapter, verse 7. It says, in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example to those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Okay, so same terminology. Same terminology. So we know Sodom and Gomorrah, they're destroyed by fire. Mm-hmm. We know that. Uh, but there is no fire burning there as far as I know. But it's used, the expression eternal fire, in a sense that the consequences of that, that destruction was forever. Mm. So nobody escaped and the fire burned until everything was brought to ashes. Yeah. So this is the meaning. So like today... If someone is, is the neighbor's house is on fire, what do I do? I call to Puzilo, I call the, the, the fire brigade, and they come and put it out. Yeah. So try to call the fire brigade when the God's fire comes. So if it's an unquenchable fire. It's an unquenchable fire. fire. Yeah. And it's yeah. something that I don't think we fully understand because even the earth will burn. Yeah. Everything will be just a, a, a um, natural catastrophe. Um, where Apostle Peter in Second Peter chapter three 
Uh, it talks about even the heavenly bodies will yeah, burn. Even the elements will burn. Even the elements will burn. So, so definitely, uh, and that will take place at the second coming of Christ before the millennium. So if these type of events, uh, like uh, the, the heavens will be rolled up like a scroll. I mean, the, the description of the second coming is not a joke. Mm. All right? So, so there's nothing left after the second seven plagues that we, we studied last time. So there's, there's nothing left on this earth to believe that there will be uh, uh, 1,000 years of, of peace and tra tranquility and Satan will be isolated somewhere and will just live very happily for 1,000 years. This is just a fantasy. It's not in the book of Revelation. All right, so... Um, very, very important to read the text and to allow the text to, to tell us exactly, exactly what it is. There is eternal because the fire burns all the way to the end. There is eternal because the consequences of that fire are forever. Yeah, and, and the Greek is actually um, can also be read as unto the end of the age. Yeah. Yeah. So it gives a end end time. Yeah, finishing time. You've been talking about ashes. Mm. Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, in the last chapter of the last book of the Old Testament, says in verse 3, You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I will do this, says the Lord. Mm. <laughs> Which is a pretty graphic picture, but it conveys the reality of... Yeah. And the evil's done. But then we continue in this sequence to a new heaven and a new earth. Yeah, yeah. So what had existed is gone yeah. and there is a new existence. And we'll pick up on that in our next session. Let's go on to the final picture here in Revelation 20. So this is verse 11 to 15. And it says there, Then I saw a great white throne, and on him who was seated on it, uh, and sorry, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. Back to our exercise in transparency. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades was thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. What are we seeing as the final part of the picture here? I think it's God's perspective of what is happening at the end. So uh, we saw Satan's perspective. We, um, we saw the saint's perspective being in heaven uh, and having the authority to judge. And then um, we see the, the lost people perspective. Uh, and now we see the God's, God's perspective, uh, the final, final destruction that is going to take place. Well, what I find interesting here is it says the sea gave up the dead that were in it. So definitely these are the people that lost their salvation. So we've got just, so we've got two groups. We've got those whose names are in the book of life. Yeah. They're the saved. And then we've got those whose deeds are in the books. They're the lost that are being raised up out of the, the yes. sea. Yes. And I'm intrigued that here it doesn't say, and the hell gave up the, the dead that were in it. Why does he say that? Yeah. And he says the death and the Hades that are not the hell. And why does he say the hell? Because, because nobody is in hell. Because the hell has not existed until this moment in time when the lake of fire will come. Yeah. So the lake, the, the hell will exist. The Bible calls it the lake of fire. But right at the end, time-wise, right at the end for a short period of time, we don't know how, how long, how short it is going to be, uh, but it, it I, I just jumped on me. Yeah. It didn't say that the grave gave up, the, the, the hell gave up the people that were in it. It says, no, the sea, uh, so where people died, yeah, you know, in drought or in, in, you know, drowning in the sea or like the Egyptians when the Red Sea closed up. And, um, so wherever people died, 
and they lost their salvation, they will come up from those locations to the judgment to receive the, the final penalty for their actions. Right. I would like to say that, you know, it, it speaks uh, terrible sin. That's something, you know, like, like that's a vengeance of God. Now, I, I don't like it, this expression, and I would say, uh, what is the real punishment for those people? It is the fire, mm. or it is maybe the punishment is the result only of their choice. But the punishment is that they can see the holy city. Yeah. The punishment is that, that you know, they, they love it. Uh, I will compare it to, to a very funny situation. It happened normally, I was traveling a lot by trains in Poland. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, usually I was on the platform 10 minutes before the train, waiting for the train, came in, and it was everything wonderful. It happened once that I was not sure exactly about the time when, uh, when the train comes. So that's the reason I thought that probably I have time, and I came in the last second. Mm. And then I came to the platform at the moment as the train started to move. It was painful. Mm. There was, you know, something that, that, you know, I had to go and I couldn't do anything with these. You could say it, I couldn't do anything better. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, of course, we can't compare. That's the same. But, you know, if you lose something, what you desire, and, and that's, so I, I see the punishment in these. Mm. They, they were laughing at, as they heard maybe or, or read some books, some articles about what God has prepared for us. What, what is the future? They, they said, the well, that, that are fables, not, not to listen. And suddenly they see, well, that's reality. Mm, mm, mm. They see it. And there is no entrance for that. There's one author I've read that takes an interesting tack on this, and I think it gives us a, a sense of it. He says that what you've got pictured here is what happens to both those that are saved and those that are lost in the presence of God. For those that are saved, they've been transformed into the likeness of God. Yeah. For those that are lost, they can't exist in the presence of God, and so his, you know, his brightness consumes them. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's the full picture, but I think it gives us a, a good insight into what you're saying, Roman. It's, it's that sense of they've, they've missed the train. In a sense, we're talking about cancer, aren't we? And you, you, I had a cancer on my face once, and I went to the doctor, and the doctor said, we've got to cut it out. So he took out the scalpel and he removed the cancer. And that's what we're looking at here. The universe is in harmony with God, except for this little world and is God going to leave that cancer to continue to possibly expand and grow no he will remove it and in removing it the cancer is gone and you're back to mm. well, living to restore in hell. what was intended yes yeah yes there is also another thing you know there is there is a symbolic language here you know how to put the death this is not anything. Yeah, how do you kill death? Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's, that's, you know, into, into, into the lake of fire. You know, the same Hades, what we understand that's the yeah. grave. Yeah. Uh, you know, so how to put it? It means the end of that. That's, yes. that's the only thing uh, on the way we can understand it. But the, yeah. that's, that's a very interesting passage. I, I just want to add something here at this point. And you may remember a few years ago, there was a, a case where there was a man in the, the United States I think he'd been a school bus driver. He was respected and people thought he was okay. And then one day a woman escaped from his basement and went to the police and there'd been two women in his basement locked up for the best part of oh, a decade or two. Not surprisingly, suddenly everyone went for think from thinking he was okay to he was a monster. Mm. Um, what we get pictured here, and I want to come back to what you said, Michael, and essentially what I heard you say was hell is an event. Mm not a eternally burning place. It comes back for me to the justice of God. If God is a good and loving God with a torture chamber on the side, then he's not a good and loving God. Yeah. Justice will, will have a time and a place where it says, you know, no more sin, but it's not going to give eternal life to those that are evil and let them live on forever, being tormented forever. Yes. Um, I think it's a whole justice of God question. 
So, so that's probably my, you know, the thing I want to touch on to finish with. But let's, let's just read this passage in John chapter 5 and then I'll come to you for, for final comments. John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, this is Jesus speaking. He says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. That's the summary version. So final final comments on this chapter. Roman, I'll start with you. Oh, so I will... I will quote one verse from Mm -hmm. Malachi, you know, because it inspired me, as Peter called before. He was in chapter 4, but I would like in the very end of chapter 3. Now they uh, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who who serves him. Beautiful. And that's... Mm -hmm. That's the great thing, you know, because we said about these terrible things also what's happened. But there is a positive. There, is, there are those followers of Jesus. And I just dream about it to be in this group. We will be taken because God is going to spare me. And he's, the verse says that, you know, as a man spares his own son. Yeah. Oh, wait a moment, God didn't spare his own son. Yeah. He gave him for me. Thank you. Peter? Most people have a desire to see justice enacted. And the example you gave of the man who had women locked in his basement for many years and that, and how the attitude of people changed and that when, when he was punished, everyone felt that that was the right Just. outcome, mm. the, the justice. And what you've got here in this slide is the first resurrection is that God's people are taken away from the, from the scene of where they were tormented. Mm-hmm. They've escaped that. And then the second resurrection is that those, the man who had been the tormentor was put on trial. Justice was enacted and, and he was given a sentence and the sentence was yeah. brought to fruition. So we're looking at a similar situation here. God will do right. God will do right. He will take his people away from the place of torment and then he will bring an end to that place where torment was Mm. and it will be made new again. Thanks, Peter. Mm -hmm. Michael, final comment. Oh, that's a challenge. (laughs) (laughs) There's so many things in in this chapter that that we we can talk about. Um, But, yeah, if if, uh, I have to, to make the final comment, I would say... God is consistent from the beginning all the way to the end. And we know the, the way the Bible is describing God with such a consistency from the Garden of Eden uh, where Adam and Eve sinned and then we see God's justice, God's, God's uh, mercy um, in the same time in action. And we see just justice and mercy together all the way to the end. We stop at the cross, we look at at Jesus on the cross, and we'll see justice and mercy together on that cross. Mercy for us sinners, and justice in the same time, because he took upon himself uh, (coughs) the death that we deserved, and he gave us his righteousness. So, So it's just amazing that all the way to the end, we see the consistency of God's character and You know, I was just wrestling with this idea, uh, you know, for for the last few weeks. And I was thinking there is only one concept that I can can, um, uh, bring it to, and that is God's holiness. Mm. It's it's so, such a deep concept, God's holiness. And I think it will be a topic of, of study for eternity to understand God's holiness because that holiness is attracting us to him. We feel his love, the warmth that comes from him. But in the same time, he says, go and sin no more. And this is serious. All right. So there are two, there are two aspects 
that we, we find in God's holiness that is an attraction to Him that is irresistible. Uh, we want to be with Him, but in the same time, there's a warning, you have to do something with your sins. And we know there's a solution for our sins, because this is why Jesus died. So for me, uh, Revelation 20, it's the, it's the pinnacle of God's holiness and God's justice and love that is manifested in a world that rejected him. Uh, and uh, um, it, it, and we, we can see even in the lake of fire, God's love, because God doesn't, allow, doesn't let these people to live um, in, in torment for eternity. He puts an end to it. All right, and for us, for the people that have have decided to follow him, uh, to be with him in eternity. So it's it's just amazing how all this concept just comes together very nicely in Revelation 20. Mm. Thank you, Michael. We're going to pray to finish now, and then we'll tell you about the next session. Let's just pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for these pictures you've given us in Revelation 20 that reveal a God who exercises radical transparency because he loves us and wants us to know him and to know that not only can we find in Christ the ability to be saved, but we can find in God a God to be trusted. So, Lord, just give us that ability to to trust you and to choose you day by day. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, next time when we are back together, we will be digging into the final two chapters of Revelation, chapter 21 and 22. Beautiful chapters. Have a read of them before we get there. All about the new earth and eternity. See you then.